going to discuss uh, language policy, I would like to integrate it uh, to another view of uh, uh, policy for education, just understanding that language policy cannot be seen without a policy that is related to education at the same time. So I'm also sharing some of the views that we've been discussing in, uh, in our project, an international project, with the Brazil Canada project, and now at the Ministry of Education as well, right? So what is it? Uh, so I think that uh, we've been focusing on something that is important for teachers. So we're dealing with teachers all over Brazil now. So all of the regions are involved in this project. So um, we find it important that they observe that we are not living the moments that we had in the past that had to do with heavy models, right? Especially because uh, lots of teachers would think of teachers that had a very important role in the past. Teachers that were remarkable for their lives, for example. However, what we've been emphasizing is the idea that maybe those teachers are not the ones that would fit the nowadays society. What is that for? This is something for them to rethink the idea that we are not living the age of models, but we are living the age, an age now that deals with conflicts and contradictions. That requires another kind of teacher, that requires another kind of education, and also another, another policy for teaching languages. So these are some of the contradictions that uh, I think we've been dealing with, that is new, new and old, creation and innovation, and uh, they pose new challenges to teaching, learning, and education in current and future societies, according to what we've seen. And this applies to Brazil. Uh, so, we've found in the theories of new literacies uh, a very good opportunity to rethink those issues in teacher education. Uh, you're going to see some words uh, in, in, the, in the left, right, and some words in the right side of each, of each line. And those in the left are usually the ones that teachers taught for a long time in Brazil, such as content, structures, critical reading, reading, language, foreign, foreign languages, for example. And what we've been adding to this without excluding the value of the first words, right, is abilities, uh, structures, however, communication, understanding communication not only as it was seen some time ago as communicative approach, but understanding communication nowadays as interaction that requires agency from students and from teachers as well. So it's not critical reading, but critical <coughs> literacies as well, and literature, culture, language, and education at the same time, right? So for this, um, we've been asked, why, why do you, why do you uh, use literacies? What are these studies about? What is this new concept to us? And uh, we found in the studies uh, developed by uh, Prince Lu, for example, and uh, Lang Noble and Copen Calensis and various other authors, uh, some explanations that apply to our situations in Brazil that are le leading us to rethink what uh, those policies could be like. So understanding literacies in their different generations so that teachers can also understand that. I mean, rethink the, the idea of model that they used to have in the past. What is that? Understanding that we first in Brazil had a generation that was called alphabetização for literacies. Alphabetização meaning learning how to read and write. The one that, that was very, very much criticized and rethought by Freire, and that also um, led to other studies, and I would uh, quote, I would mention uh, Brian Street and uh, various other authors that had great contribution to the second generation of literacies, the one that questioned the idea of an autonomous model uh, for uh, learning how to read and write, and, uh, but at the same time, it's still attached to mother tongue when thinking how to read and write, okay, uh, was important, right? So it was still attached to mother tongue and still concentrated on reading and writing, still understanding language in its two modalities, that is 
written language and oral language. Nowadays, I think that we live another generation of uh, literacies, right? And what is this generation of literacies like? So it is the one that, that uh, proposes different issues or different discussions whenever talking of languages, whenever deciding about the ways to teach languages. For example, it encompasses the various school disciplines. It cannot be seen separately, you know, it's not something to, to be worked only on mother tongue, by mother tongue. It rethinks curriculum, school society relationship, teacher-student relationship, language in its modalities, language in its communities of practices, and it investigates the phenomenon of globalization, the advent or presence of technology in society. So that makes a huge difference when we rethink uh, the idea of language, attach it to that first generation view that many teachers used to think of, right? That is learning how to, learning a foreign lang language would be very similar to learning uh, mother tongue, you see? So, uh, I just found, uh, I came across this theory, the theories developed by Kalantzis and Kolp in, in this uh, book published in 2008. And I found it interesting that they, they kind of uh, uh, understand the differences in education in three dif in different historic moments, right? Uh, let's say a pedagogy in a first moment would uh, require, let's say, knowledge to be repeated, right? This is something that I would, the way I would summarize, right? So teachers would be uh, very much concerned about <coughs> teaching a foreign language, also having this idea of repetition in mind. It, it would be learning language, uh, that is acquiring vocabulary, acquiring structures, and being able to repeat it efficiently or proficiently, right? So in a second moment, we would see understanding how learners deconstruct and reconstruct knowledge and respond <coughs> directly within their own reasoning. This would, I would see some more um, influenced by Vygotsky in the studies of uh, language, right? And in the third one, we would, we would see um, an attempt to lead learners to transit by the different things that he or she knows how to do, connecting them to his or her diversified world experiences, constructing knowledge. So this is a, a third moment that the authors uh, point out and uh, when they refer to the curriculum, they are trying to explain, they are trying to connect the relation between pedagogy and curriculum in this sense. That is, this, uh, I mean, that very first historic moment is what ex explains why the curriculum then became a bit prescriptive, right? So uh, use, making use of external knowledge to be copied and reproduced in school. In a second moment, the school values would change a bit, that is, Making, uh, taking into account the students' relevance, uh, needs, and diversity or diversity, right? Uh, so we would see words such as constructivism and so on. In the third moment then, this is when we start seeing alternative learning paths, right? That is, curriculum is oriented to developing agency. So my bold in agency right here. This is then when we, f we find more affinity with these theories, the ones that we've been developing in the national uh, project, as well as the ones that we've been designing, uh, that we've been making use to design the new orientations for a teacher education plan at the Ministry of Education. Right? So the idea is education is <coughs> anywhere. It's not only for schools. You can learn outside schools, right? So what is also identified as public education by Giroud. However, I also associate those theories developed, developed by Kalantzis and Cole with uh, Saviani's uh, theories. Saviani is a Brazilian philosopher of education, and I decided to connect the theories by Kalantzis and Cole in a way as to reinterpret, right, uh, what is developed already by our colleagues from other countries, but apply them to a Brazilian situation. This is the reason why I resorted to Saviani's uh, texts again, in order to see, in order to be able to reinterpret those theories. That is, 
according to this author, we should try to understand a uh, kind of a circle um, relation between the, our classroom practice, our pedagogy, and our educational philosophy. You know, we used to understand why certain things happen the way they happen. But in a way is to understand what kind of society we want when we adopt a certain um, plan, a certain, let's say, uh, linguistic uh, proposal, right? So this is the reason why I then developed, this, is, this was not written by Kalantzis and Kobo, though I found all this information in their books. But I decided to follow the table that they had designed before in order to, tell, to talk about educational philosophy, the one that has to do with which society and which individual we want to uh, educate in our school or uh, through our proposals, right? So I would follow the same reasoning uh, just to explain to teachers and to discuss with the teachers that we've been dealing with uh, that that very first moment, the moment that uh, talked about repetition, they talked about having a model to follow, for example, would be very convenient for a historic moment, the one that, had, that, that uh, talked about a pre-industrial and industrial society. Uh, that was a moment uh, that we would see the, the growth of capitalism or probably what, the consolidation or probably another word would be better for capitalism, what is also called as Fordism, a liberal and enlightenment society, right? So in a second moment, this would be closer to the Second World War, then we would find it industrial and fast capitalism, this, I mean, post-Second World War. Post-Fordism, what is also called Toyotism, just, it's not the Ford uh, make anymore, right? but it's another one. So new liberal, enlightenment society, and in a third moment now, a certain crisis on new liberal values of Fast capitalism, although not many people share the same view, right? But this is also uh, identified by the authors. Um, and it makes a, a difference in the relationship of difference. I mean, now we start acknowledging difference. And we would contrast this idea with the other one that <coughs> emphasized models, right? So, uh, uh, through the emphasis on models, difference is not contemplated. Here, this is, uh, in this uh, society, in this design of society, we're going to see difference more visible. Right? So th these words here were uh, added by me because uh, what I identify in that first historic moment in terms of a, a philosophy of education to understand what society we live in now would be the society of repetition in the first moment. Repeating well was very important for workers, for individuals, right? In, in another moment, society started requiring uh, people that were able to adapt or to be flexible or to have initiative, right? And it, now, in this present moment, society uh, starts thinking of another kind of individual or another kind of student that is the one that uh, <laughs> Uh, that uh, develops his agency and his capacity to create and working uh, in groups or having uh, working in collaboration in groups. So we are going to see different values, right, uh, in these uh, proposals, right? So this is exactly what I see. Ah, so this is exactly what I see when we talk of. Uh, uh, proposals when I talk of uh, policies uh, related to languages. So I do not understand, and I think that in Brazil we do not understand that language policies should be seen out of a scenario that considers education, the kind of society that we are contributing to develop, the kind of individual that we are contributing to develop. But then we have other challenges such as what is the starting point? How do we start dealing with these new policies? What to, what to do with them, right? So this is the idea. So I would like to have these uh, answers already, you know, uh, responded here. But maybe this is also a starting point or an arrival point. I don't know 
for us to uh, talk a little bit more later, okay? So thank you very much.